for so many people, history is not about primary source documents. It's not about empirical evidence. It's a story that they're told. It's a story that they tell. It's an heirloom that's passed down over generations where loyalty takes precedence over truth. Trying to piece together a portrait of the historical Jesus has bamboozled scholars for a good 200 years. There are certain things that scholars agree on in terms of the basic facts of his life, and then there is room for a great deal of argument and speculation. What many people don't realize about the Gospels is they're not contemporary eyewitness accounts of what happened. And lots of people have thought that they were. They're anonymous writings. We don't know who Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John happen to be. And the story they all describe is carefully crafted. You think of the Gospels as you would a politician trying to persuade. This is the story of the conspiracy that Dan Brown missed. More significant than the Da Vinci Code, it's a story that has been hidden for more than 2,000 years. It goes right back to the very beginnings of Christianity, and if true, could rock everything that Christians believe in. It's the story of the people who are closest to Jesus, the people who shared his bloodline. In this film, I will decode the Bible and other ancient texts to reveal for the first time the real story of Jesus' family. Because I believe that Jesus had brothers and sisters, cousins, aunts, uncles and nephews a large extended family that existed for at least 300 years after his death and played a crucial role in the founding of Christianity. That their original message was too dangerous for the new religion. And that the official church stole their movement and then tried to delete them from the story. This is the oldest Bible in the world. It's over 1,600 years old and it contains a complete version of the New Testament. It's the oldest complete record of Christianity's origins. The very founding words of the new religion are spoken by Jesus and his followers. For many people, it's literally the Word of God. But scattered throughout the pages of this book are some mystifying references to a group of people even closer to Jesus, his human family and his closest companions. But incredibly, they hardly get a mention at all. It's almost as if they didn't exist. Is not this the carpenter's son? Isn't his mother called Mary and his brothers James, Joseph, Simon and Judas? Aren't all of his sisters with us? A multitude was sitting around him and they told him, Behold, your mother, your brothers and your sisters are outside looking for you. And he answered them. Since the tomb was close at hand, they laid Jesus there. Now, on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came early to the tomb while it was still dark. This is the church of the Holy Sepulchre, the holiest site in all of Christendom. It's the place where Jesus was crucified, entombed, and then rose from the dead. What happened here is absolutely crucial to all believing Christians, including myself. Without the resurrection, there is no Christianity. And the prime witness to this event? A woman, Mary Magdalene. The most famous conspiracy theories surrounding Jesus concern his relationship with Mary Magdalene. Trouble is, they are all wrong. In the novel The Da Vinci Code of Dan Brown, Soleil Teabing is actually saying that the marriage of Jesus and Mary Magdalene is the greatest cover-up in human history. And I don't think that uh, Jesus and Mary Magdalene were married or that they had uh, a daughter. But uh, I do think that you can speak of a cover-up with reference to Mary Magdalene because her importance to Christianity was diminished. 
All the conspiracy theorists have missed the real story of Mary Magdalene. It has nothing to do with fanciful notions of her marrying Jesus or having his children. It's far more real and dangerous, so much so that the church has covered it up for 2,000 years. Yes, I'm, I'm convinced that Mary Magdalene is the, the founder, well, next to Jesus, of course, of Christianity. And if you examine the historical sources, the evidence is almost overwhelming. All four of the Gospels agree that Mary was at Jesus' crucifixion and death, and three of them have her as the first witness to the resurrection. Countless other second and third century sources cite her as Jesus' closest companion. But incredibly, in the rest of the Bible, she's hardly mentioned. By contrast, Peter and Paul, the two men who traditionally founded the church, are referred to hundreds of times. I would say that she is uh, more important than Peter and Paul. Her story is sim has simply been downplayed because at the time it would not have been a great help for Christianity to preach their message, having to admit that they, they had it from a woman. After Jesus' death, and as the new Christian movement was evolving, a conscious effort was made by the church fathers to marginalize and downplay Jesus' real family and close friends such as Mary. They just didn't fit the story that Peter, a man, founded the church, and Paul, another man, was its chief theologian. And in the case of Mary, her downfall was based on two things, power and sex. Just outside the walls of Jerusalem, near the Garden of Gethsemane, 31 Russian Orthodox nuns have dedicated their lives to honor the memory of Mary Magdalene. We're in a place, geographically, where we know Mary Magdalene would have walked and would have met with Jesus and the disciples. What does she mean to you? Mary Magdalene is an excellent example of how a Christian should be bold, energetic, yet she's modest and, you know, soft and the myrrh bearer, you know, she brought myrrh, she wanted to anoint Christ's, you know, body and, you know, make it sweet smelling and, for example, so very feminine in her way, yet very um, strong and superior in another way in her faith. I feel that one of the reasons Mary Magdalene hasn't received the respect is because of sexism. Mm -hmm. Because people wanted to write her out of the story of Jesus because they were negative about women. How do you feel about that? I think it's a possibility, but I also think from an orthodox point of view, from my experience, that her soul just went above the male-female thing. Mm. And I know that you're saying she has a really bad rap. Mm. And I, just, I agree with you because I would want everybody to know about her because by her example, the world would be a different place. Just 200 years after Jesus' death, the church fathers began to undermine Mary's true status. They questioned her resurrection experience, claimed that she didn't believe in Jesus' divinity and even suggested that her personal reputation was suspect. It was a time when women were still second-class citizens and the church was teaching that anything to do with sex was bad. <laughs> I think that Mary Magdalene has been downplayed by some of the writers within the New Testament. I think they've edited out some of the stories. Well, as an Orthodox nun, the image I have of St. Mary Magdalene equal to the Apostles is so intense and so righteous. I mean, just incredibly, you know, huge. <laughs> mm, mm. Uh, I feel that she walks here because we honor her. And mm. I feel any other person or writer or commentator or holy, whatever you said, you said fathers, mm. I don't know which fathers, but who don't honor her, then they've lost out. The Church Fathers' campaign against Mary Magdalene culminated in the 6th century, 
when the Pope declared in a sermon that the seven demons she had been cured of by Jesus were in fact the seven cardinal sins. For the next 1400 years, she was portrayed as a prostitute. Now the Holy Fathers say that the demons were passions or something inside her that weren't active. She didn't actually do them, but she had to fight them. And they were, that was a big struggle. And so he healed her of that struggle. Do we know what happened to her at the end of her life? Well, she went to Ephesus and she died there. And then her relics were transferred from Ephesus to Constantinople in the ninth century, I think. And then they sort of got dispersed all over after that. Mm. Do you have any of them here? Yes. Can I see them? Sure. So, St. Mary Magdalene, with a piece of her, I think it's her hand, right here. Yeah. Wow. That's, that's, <laughs> yeah. that's, that's heavy. I know, it's pretty intense. So that's a piece of the arm of Mary Magdalene? Yes. For mainstream Christianity, Mary Magdalene is uh, a dangerous figure because you can't admit a woman uh, as a very important figure in the church without having to argue about women nowadays. I think the Mary Magdalene cover-up is a great tragedy for, uh, for the church and for the culture as a whole. But it wasn't just her sex that caused Mary trouble. She also fell foul of one of the church's earliest power struggles. To understand it, you have to examine some of the ancient Christian texts that were deliberately kept out of the Bible. Many had to be hidden away for hundreds of years to escape the church's destructive power. One of the most important is the second century Gospel of Mary. It pitches Mary Magdalene in a battle for power with the church's traditional founder, St. Peter. Peter asked the others about the Saviour. Did he really speak with a woman in private? Should we all turn and listen to her? Did he really prefer her to us? In the Gospel of Mary, Mary has the leading role in the new church, but Peter refuses to accept her and constantly questions her authority. Levi said to Peter, you are always angry. Now I see you are arguing against this woman like an adversary. If the Saviour made her worthy, who are you to reject her? Today, Peter's home is one of the most important pilgrimage sites in the Holy Land. I had arranged to meet Father Stefano, a Franciscan monk and an archaeologist. Now tell me, how important was Simon Peter to the gospel story? How important was it to Jesus? I think there, there was a special link between them. A friendship, very hard friendship, and uh, a special love between them. Peter gave to him the most beautiful room of his house, the house the archaeologists found. In terms of the Catholic tradition, your authority then is a direct line from St. Peter. That's it. That's it. Because Peter, at the end of his life, became the first bishop of Rome. So the bishop of Rome have the tradition of St. Peter. In promoting Peter, the Church Fathers wrote Mary almost completely out of the story. The bitterness of this battle is recorded in another Christian text suppressed by the Church, the Pistis Sophia. Mary came forward and said, My master, I understand in my mind that I can come forward at any time, but I am afraid of Peter, because he threatens me and hates our sex. Five miles away from Peter's home is another ancient site controlled by the church, Magdala, the home of Mary Magdalene. Until now, the church has refused all public access. How come this place is all locked up? Because uh, it's not prepared it's not to prepared welcome yet. people. And uh, also because it was an abandon for more than 30 years after the excavation was made. So how big was the ancient city of Magdala? According to the written sources, 
more than 40,000 people. 40,000 people? In time of Jesus. So it was possibly bigger than Capernaum. It was a city. One of the few times the Bible does mention Mary underlines her crucial contribution to the birth of Christianity. And the twelve were with him, and also some women who had been healed of evil spirits. Mary, called Magdalene, Joanna, the wife of Chusa, and Susanna, and many others who provided for him out of their means. Not only did Mary follow Jesus, she was also his patron. Mary was the more closest person to Jesus. She was like uh, her girlfriend, something like. Mm. It was a like revolution mm. for the mentality of that time. Mm. Because uh, one who professed his, himself to be the Messiah used to spoke, to stay with woman. Mm. And she turns up when Jesus dies. Right. She yeah. was there under the cross. The yeah. other disciple go away. Disappeared. disappeared. Even Simon, so Simon Peter disappears. Right. Mary is faithful. She's committed. She, she does a great there. deal. She's the first evangelist. So how come there isn't the same kind of effort into restoring the place where the first evangelist, a woman, comes from? That's it. This is the only area excavated. All the other area, according to the new town planning, will be hotels mm. by the sea and commercial area by the way. Over the ancient monastery, there is the... Fairground. Yeah. They've put a fairground over the ancient you monastery. Can imagine. But what I don't understand is, when I go to Capernaum, where we've just come from, there's a lot of money, time and energy that's gone into it because it's St. Peter. But here, where it's Mary Magdalene, they, they, there doesn't seem to be the same kind of effort into okay. maintaining it's very or easy. remembering yeah. this woman's connection with Jesus. I think this. We have work to do. <laughs> the Mary Magdalene cover-up was not a total success. When the official Christian story was being written, the Bible writers could not remove one key passage. In John's Gospel, Mary is described as weeping outside the tomb, having discovered that Jesus' body has disappeared. She goes in for one final look and is startled by a familiar voice. She turned around and saw it was Jesus and said to him in Aramaic, Rabuni. He replied, do not touch me. He then told her to go and tell the other disciples about the resurrection. It's an incredibly powerful moment and arguably the most important in the Christian story. Without the resurrection, Jesus couldn't be the Son of God. And without that, there'd be no Christianity. And if you decode the language, an even more interesting story emerges. Rabuni, the name she called Jesus, is very curious. It's a term that normally means teacher. But here, it sounds like a term of endearment, a mark of a special relationship. And Jesus replies to her with, do not touch me, implying that this is what they would normally do when they met. They would touch. It all points to a very personal, close and special relationship between Mary Magdalene and Jesus. Why else would he appear to her, a woman, first? In the Church of the Holy Sepulchre itself, beneath the rock on which Jesus was supposed to have been crucified, I was told there was more hidden evidence of Mary's true status. This is very special. This is the hand of Mary Magdalene. That is the hand of Mary Magdalene. My goodness. This is the hand of Mary Magdalene that tried touching Jesus and touched. Is it brought out at any time? Yeah, never. This is never, they take it out. So it doesn't come out of this room? No, no. Are you sure it's a hand? Yes, this is a hand. Yes. It's written there. Greek. The hand of Mary Magdalene. French, Russian, and in oh. Greek, three languages. It's written there. Mary Magdalene. Mary Magdalene. Wow. Right hand. Right hand. Right hand. Right. 
At the entrance to the church, there is a massive mosaic mural that, when decoded, summarizes Mary's story and how the church still feels about her. At the crucifixion, dressed in green, she is prominently depicted and at the laying out of his body too. But by the time of his burial, she has simply become a face in the crowd, relegated to the back of the Christian story. And just as the church has denied Mary Magdalene her real status, the truth of Jesus' blood family has also been locked away for 2,000 years. In the next part, I reveal their real story, one that shatters the myth of the traditional holy family of Jesus, Mary and Joseph. One of the Roman Catholic and Orthodox Church's biggest annual feast days is that of the birth of Mary, the mother of Jesus. Festivals are held all over the Christian world. Her icons are paraded. But one thing is never mentioned, her real blood family. The whole question about the identity of Jesus' brothers and sisters in the Gospels is very much tied and linked to the identity of Jesus and his mother. And as Jesus becomes ever more seen as divine and Mary becomes ever more the perpetual virgin, then it becomes heretical to say that these are our ordinary brothers and sisters. We've already heard how I believe the real founder of Christianity, a woman, Mary Magdalene, was forced out of her rightful place by a male conspiracy. But the story of Jesus' mother, Mary, was also manipulated to fit the new church's theology. Any suggestion that she had more children apart from Jesus was condemned as heresy. The Church of the Nativity in Bethlehem is built over the site of Jesus' supposed birthplace. It's dedicated to the worship of his family, as the church sees it. This is one of the earliest pictures of the Holy Family that the church has, but it's a very traditional image. You have Jesus in the middle, and then on one side Mary, and on the other side Joseph. But there's only three of them. So where are the other members of Jesus' family? The Bible clearly states that Jesus had four brothers and sisters too. It even names some of them. Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, and brother of James, and Joseph, and Judas, and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? These biblical references are a major problem for the church. And over the centuries, theologians have had to concoct some extraordinary theories to deny Jesus' blood relatives. All of these explanations about Jesus' brothers and sisters are all attempts to explain them away. The problem comes when you see Mary as a perpetual virgin. She clearly can't have any more children, and so the references to Jesus' brothers and sisters clearly can't be that. And so people have come up with all sorts of ways of explaining them. But the plain text of the Gospel really does just say that they're simply brothers and sisters of Jesus. This star indicates the birthplace. It is written upon the star by Latin words, Christ was born from the Virgin Mary. You can see the letters? Yeah. So, in your tradition, the Holy Family consists of Jesus and his parents, Mary, Mary and, and Joseph. Joseph. What about when the Bible tells us about Jesus having brothers? Do you acknowledge that Jesus had brothers and sisters? You know, Saint Joseph was married before Virgin Mary. Virgin Mary, she get pregnant from the Holy Spirit. Mm. So Joseph had children before he yes. married Mary, yes. and therefore when the New Testament talks about Jesus having brothers, they're really half-brothers. Yes. They're not his full brothers. Yes, of course. But they are his brothers yes. through, through Joseph. Yes. This theory, that Jesus' family were only half-brothers and sisters, the sons and daughters of Joseph from a previous marriage, 
is mostly based on a second century non-biblical Christian text called the Gospel of James. It portrays Joseph as an aging widower chosen by the chief priest of the temple to look after the 14-year-old Virgin Mary. There's a suggestion that after the birth of Jesus, Mary had children. Do, do you believe Mary had children? No, no, never. No. It's impossible? No. The Virgin Mary, it was virgin uh, during the birth, before the birth, and after the birth. So she stayed a perpetual virgin? Of course. The Gospel of James goes to incredible lengths to prove Mary's perpetual virginity. Salome said, as the Lord my God lives, unless I thrust in my finger and investigate her parts, I will not believe that a virgin has given birth. Then Salome went in, and the midwife said, Mary, show yourself, for a small test concerning you is about to take place. And Salome inserted her finger into her body and cried out, Woe is me for my unbelief. Amazingly, in the 5th century, the Gospel of James was condemned as heresy. Saint Joseph, he didn't sleep with her, never, never, never. So the Christian traditions who believe that they did have children, you would say that they're wrong? Yes, of course. Will God judge them for that? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> what you heard? It's not just the Greek Orthodox Church that has a problem with Jesus' blood family. Whilst I was in Bethlehem, I bumped into some members of the Ethiopian church, including their archbishop, Abba Melchizedek. A pleasure to meet you. A pleasure to meet you. I was wondering if you could tell me how, in your tradition, you understand the parts of the New Testament where Jesus is said to have brothers. So we, don't, we don't believe that. You don't believe that he had no. any, any brothers? No. no. Jesus himself said uh, to his disciples, uh, my brothers, like that is all. That's it. So See, all uh, the followers of Jesus Christ are his brothers. No, we believe okay. Jesus is the son of God. Thank you. God bless you. God bless you. 1600 years ago, the first heresy the early church faced questioned Jesus' divinity. It caused a bloody struggle that ended in Jesus being declared the Son of God. The more Jesus is exalted in his mother, the more that the family are simply ignored. They're just dropped. They're just part of the, part of the, the picture, but not in any real sense. Jesus isn't really given a proper family, and so they're just simply seen as stepbrothers or, or cousins. Excuse me. What are these made of? These are made out of the olive wood. Yeah. It's all hand carved. Yeah. Now, now tell me who the characters are in the nativity scene. Now you have the Holy Family. Yeah. The Holy Family, Mary, Joseph. And the baby. And the baby. The earliest texts of the New Testament say absolutely nothing about Mary's virginity. In fact, Paul's letter to the Galatians describes Jesus as being born of a woman, not a virgin. One of the interesting things about the New Testament is that the earliest passages don't seem to know anything at all about the virgin birth. Paul never mentions it at all, and the earliest gospel, Mark, doesn't mention it either. Even John's gospel, which has a fairly exalted picture of Mary, doesn't seem to know anything about the virgin birth. The traditions are simply in Luke's gospel and Matthew's gospel. The whole point is to show that Jesus is truly the Son of God. And the clearest way that you can do that, metaphorically and using picture language, is to say that Mary was a virgin. Do you do Jesus' family? Mary, Joseph, Jesus, James, Jude, no. Salome. No, no, and no. So you've only got part of the holy family. You haven't got the full family of Mary and Joseph. No, no, but if you want, we can do it. For you can do that for me. Because it's our work. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Of all the churches, the Roman Catholic has done the most to erase all mention of Jesus' real blood family. 1600 years ago, one of its most revered theologians, Jerome, devised another theory. He claimed that Joseph had a brother, and this brother was married to somebody also called Mary, and it's their children who are described in the New Testament as the brothers and sisters of Christ. 
a very clever theory and one that helped to demote the brothers and sisters of Christ to nothing more than cousins. So according to the Roman Catholic Church, not only was Mary not the mother of Jesus' brothers and sisters, but Joseph wasn't their father either. In fact, the only reason why they needed Joseph was for his pedigree, a genealogy that fulfilled the prophecy that the Messiah would come from the house of David, Israel's ancient king. Up here on the walls are the remains of a mosaic that's over a thousand years old. It depicts Jesus' genealogy going back 1,000 years directly to the house of David. The only problem is that most scholars now agree these genealogies were created by the Gospel writers to fit the new church's emerging theology. Bethlehem has one of the earliest shrines dedicated to the Virgin Mary a cave where she's supposed to have lived for a time with Jesus. The tradition here is that shortly after the birth of Jesus, the Holy Family came here where the Virgin was nursing the baby for some time. According to the tradition, we believe that some drops of her milk fell here and turned the grotto into the, to the relic of the Virgin's milk. The name of this church is the Milk Grotto. The traditional image of Jesus' mother as the Virgin Mary has been completely created by the church. Her original identity is now hidden. I noticed that everything's covered over in plastic. What's going on? Yes, well, we're in the process of renovating the church. Um, for years and years, we've wanted to make it look um, more like a house. And here, throughout the centuries, people are coming and they're burning candles and oil lamps and because of this the white stone has turned to the dark color and now we're trying to to clean it so that it looks more originally like the color of milk so when you clean this off this will turn white again just like you have right here right, with your hands here. you see how pure white the stone is inside yeah. yeah it's absolutely pure white and the further you go into it the more white it becomes wow and also, a few years ago, we had a woman from Vietnam, and she took the photo of Our Lady who was giving the milk, and it developed with two drops of milk coming from the photo. Wow. So, in your tradition, the idea of Mary having any more children after Jesus is just a, a non-starter. Is it heretical for people to say that? Well, I'm not here really to speak of uh, anything that is uh, heretical. Um, my conscience is the church. The church is, uh, is, teaches us what we're supposed to believe. This is why we have the dogmas of the church, the teachings of the church from, from, the, old, from the ancient fathers mm. who fought all of these uh, heretical problems in the church. So God said it, the Pope communicates it, and that seals it. According to faith, according to what we believe as being the full truth. Over the last 2,000 years, the church has transformed Mary from a 14-year-old Jewish peasant into the figurehead of the greatest Christian cult. From a perpetual virgin, she became the mother of God. Then in 1854, the Pope announced she had even been immaculately conceived. She is queen of the angels. She's queen of the apostles, all prophets. She's the queen of all saints. She's the queen of confessors. She's the queen of virgins. She's the queen of martyrs. And in all of God's creation, she is the most important of creatures chosen by God to be the mother of his only son. So she's number one? Next to God himself, yes. In 1950, the Pope declared that when Mary died, her body was miraculously assumed into heaven. So her tomb is empty. Much of the evidence for this is taken from a 5th century non-biblical text that even some Catholic scholars now agree is valueless as history. 
The apostles carried the couch and laid down her precious and holy body in Gethsemane in a new tomb. And for three days the voices of invisible angels were heard glorifying Christ our God. And when the third day was ended, the voices were no longer heard. And from that time forth, all knew that her spotless and precious body had been transferred to paradise. When the transitus Marii first appeared, the church declared it heresy. The veneration of Mary is one of the most important cults in the Roman Catholic and Orthodox churches. There are shrines dedicated to her all over the world. But check this out. This doctrine was the theological brainchild of a succession of church fathers and theologians. There's almost no evidence for her veneration in the Bible. And of course, as Mary's status rose, the brothers and sisters of Jesus Christ, her real family, were almost completely written out of the story. I think this is actually to the detriment of Jesus, and particularly Jesus' humanity, because of course a human person has siblings. He grew up in an ordinary Jewish household. He grew up probably in a very noisy, very lively household, where there's lots of other brothers and sisters, where there's grandparents, perhaps an extended family. And yet I think that picture has been lost, because we tend to have this rather idealized picture of Jesus and his mother, those sort of rather solitary pictures. There is an alternative theory about Jesus' family tree. It states quite simply that like any other first century Jew, he had a family. A mother, a father, four brothers, James, Joseph, Simon and Judas, and at least two sisters, Mary and Salome. For over 1600 years, the Roman Catholic and Orthodox churches have seen this as heresy. But in the next part, I reveal that Jesus' siblings were in fact the earliest leaders of Jesus' new movement. In my quest for the secret family of Jesus, I have been invited to a Jewish wedding in Galilee in northern Israel. Two thousand years ago, there was another wedding in Galilee, a very special event that's recorded in the Bible, the famous Wedding of Cana. But what most people forget is that if it was a wedding, it must have been a family occasion. One of the most famous miracles in the Gospels is the story of the water turning into wine. It's where Jesus decides to introduce himself as a person who has miraculous powers and can do things that nobody else can do. Whether you're a child in Sunday school or you're a priest in a seminary, when you're told this story, the focus is always on the symbolism, the water turning into wine. But that's not the full picture. What we often forget is that Jesus did this at a family occasion. It was a wedding feast and it was done here in Cana in Galilee. The Bible tells us that both Jesus and his mother were there and that she appears to be the host. But it remained silent about the other guests. For 2,000 years, their real identities have remained hidden. Hello. Hello. I've just come from the church. You are welcome. And the priest told me that you speak English and that you might be able to help me. English, but not very well. I speak okay. English. Yeah. Okay. I can tell you whatever I know from my father, from my grandfather, and because you were priests. Okay. And my grand grandfather, he built the church. I'm interested in the story of the wedding feast at Cana. Who, who were the guests? The citizens here from Cana, and they were Jews. Mm. at that time, mm. yes, all of them. Mm. Uh, and Jesus came with his disciples, with his mother, you know, here, because he was invited. And we think, we are sure that he was a relative, relationship between him and between uh, uh, the, the, the people here, or the um, 
the people getting married. Yeah. So Jesus was a relative of the people who were getting married. The relatives of his mother, Maria. Yeah. Yes. yes. Yeah. I think so. Mm. Not really that you are sure because he was invited here. The biggest clue to what was really taking place is in the Bible itself. Although the Gospel writers did their best to write the family out of the wedding feast, in the very next verse, it says, Jesus went down to Capernaum with his mother, his brothers and his disciples. So they all were there. It really was a Jesus family affair. Although the editors of John's Gospel were able to write Jesus' family out of the wedding feast, they forgot to change this one crucial verse. And as a result, allowed us to decode what was really taking place. I have already revealed how both Jesus' closest companion, Mary Magdalene, and his mother, Mary, had their stories changed to suit the new movement. I now want to show who Jesus' blood family really were and how I believe they played a crucial role in the founding of Christianity. Family must have been quite large. Um, we know that Jesus had four brothers. We know he had at least two sisters, perhaps more. If you begin to think over two or three generations, the numbers of descendants uh, simply of the, that immediate family of Jesus must have been quite big. So the family isn't only the immediate family of Jesus, but also cousins um, and presumably their descendants too. Um, so we're talking about quite a lot of people. For 2,000 years, the traditional Christmas story has stated that Jesus was born in Bethlehem near Jerusalem. But many scholars are now convinced that Jesus was born here, in Galilee. And now there's even an alternative site for his birthplace. Aviram? Yeah. Good. Pleased to meet you. Pleased to meet you. Israeli archaeologist Aviram Oshri has spent the last 14 years investigating what he is convinced is Jesus' real birthplace. So what is there to see? Uh, there is nothing really to see nowadays. Nothing? No. In uh, 1965, the road was built, yeah. destroying the uh, main hall of the church, unfortunately. Yeah. And uh, in 1992, when they constructed the a new neighborhood, the infrastructure, the sewer pipe, was cutting through the church yeah. and through the ceiling of a cave. So, the road's been built on top of it? Yeah. So they've got through the main hall. During these major building works, the remains of a 6th century church were discovered, which Aviram is convinced marks the birthplace of Jesus. Yeah. Now we are in the church. It, it's about 45 meters in length and, and 25 meters in width. Right. The interesting thing is that the church was built on top of a cave, a natural cave, and there is only two ways, two possibilities of explaining the, the phenomena. The first it was just accidentally, by pure chance, built on top of a cave. Mm. And the second is that it was deliberately built on top of the cave, and that place was the genuine place of nativity. The traditional Bethlehem is also 90 miles away, a four-day journey from Jesus' hometown of Nazareth. So when in the Gospels we hear the story of Joseph and Mary travelling to Bethlehem in order to register for a Roman census, you're saying that that story needs to be challenged and questioned? Exactly. It's a myth rather than the genuine story. In addition to all that, we have the description of Mary traveling on top of a donkey while she was nine months pregnant mm. from Nazareth to uh, Bethlehem near Jerusalem. <laughs> it's simply not really making any sense that she could have made that kind of journey on top of a donkey. At nine months pregnant? At nine months pregnant. Whereas the uh, distance from Nazareth to Bethlehem of Galilee is only seven kilometers, four miles. And you think the people in the sixth century and before knew that and that's why they built this church? Yeah. Do some people have vested interests in maintaining the idea that Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea? Yeah, no doubt about that. The whole idea is that Jesus is the Messiah. Mm. And according to the Old Testament, the Messiah should come from the house of David. Mm. And David's origin is from the other Bethlehem, Bethlehem Ephrata. Mm. So that is why you, Jesus was forced to be born in the other Bethlehem. 
to make it the story fit. Yeah. I believe the historical evidence now points to Jesus being born and raised in Galilee, because it is here that his family lived. In the early 1960s, a Franciscan archaeologist called Bugatti went on a journey around Galilee. He wrote a book about his travels. In particular, he was looking for the villages in which Jesus' family lived. He was guided by a famous early Christian writer. Julius Africanus, who was um, a Christian writer of the early 3rd century and lived in Palestine, um, tells us a very interesting fact about the early members of the family of Jesus, whom he calls the Desposunoi, which means people who belong to the master or the sovereign. Those called the Desposunoi on account of their connection with the family of the Saviour, coming from the Jewish villages of Nazareth and Kokaba. They travelled around the rest of the land and interpreted the genealogy they had as far as they could trace it. Nazareth and Kokaba, which is a few miles from Nazareth, um, were evidently where the family were based. The name Kokaba means star in Hebrew, and it's possible they deliberately chose a, a village that had this name star, which was one of the symbols of the Davidic Messiah. And they probably also connected the word Nazareth with Isaiah's prophecy of the Davidic Messiah, and he calls him the branch or the shoot. Hebrew word Neitza, Nazareth. 2,000 years ago, the city of Nazareth was just a tiny village. Today, one of the largest churches in the Middle East has been built over what is, according to the Bible, Jesus' family home. We have interesting evidence that the uh, family farm continued to be owned and farmed by relatives of Jesus. Um, the two grandsons of Jude, who were important leaders in the Palestinian Christianity in the late first century, um, were said to be farmers in Nazareth. Um, and the exact size of the farm is stated, which means it, it must have been remembered in, in the Jewish Christian movement. There still survived of the relatives of Jesus, the grandsons of Judas, who, according to the flesh, was called his brother. These were informed against as belonging to the family of David. Another relative of Jesus is remembered here too. Hidden behind an iron gate in what's left of the ancient church is more proof that Jesus' family were still living here more than 200 years after his death. Now we know that there was a person called Conan who was martyred in Turkey in the third century. And when he was martyred, he said that he was a Christian from Nazareth and from the family of Jesus. I am from the city of Nazareth in Galilee, answered Conan, and I am of the family of Christ, whose worship I have inherited from my ancestors. When the monks were first excavating here 100 years ago, they discovered a small grotto that they believed was dedicated to this same Conan. So here appears to be someone who comes from Nazareth. He lived there himself at some earlier point in his life. He was now a gardener in Pamphylia in Asia Minor, but he's a member of the family of Jesus. So that also tells us that there were still members of the family living in Nazareth, at least around the beginning of the third century, which we wouldn't otherwise have known. According to Bagatti's guidebook, in a town 10 miles away, there was a burial site for another of Jesus' relatives. There is a very early Jewish tradition about a certain James of Sakhnin. Now, he was a prominent teacher, Christian, and close follower of Jesus. Now, according to my guidebook, when Bagatti gets here in 1961, the tomb is named after a James the Just. Who is this James of Sakhnin? The possibility arises there are the two grandsons of Jesus' brother Jude, whose names were James and Zoka. There's quite a good chance, I think, that James of Zikni may have been um, James, the grandson of Jude, who was um, a relative of Jesus. 
It's quite possible that this is um, a, really the site where one of the relatives of Jesus was buried. And he's probably the last person that we know belonged to the family of Jesus. Before I left, I wanted to ask the town's Greek Orthodox priest if there were any local traditions concerning Jesus' family. Now, let me tell you something. The Orthodox belief is that Jesus didn't have brothers, not at all. Now, there is another thing I need to tell you. Our belief is that he is from God, yes, from God. Now, we know that Joseph, let's say the foster father of Jesus, if you like, before Mary was brought to him in the temple, Joseph was married to someone else, another woman, and he had four children with her. Now, when Jesus was born, he grew up and spent his life with these four sons, but they were only his half-brothers. Could it be, then, that James, who, according to tradition, was mm -hmm. Joseph's son yeah. um, before Mary, right. could it be that one of his descendants mm -hmm is buried here. I don't know. I don't know. So, maybe. Okay. Maybe. Sure, sure. For 2,000 years, the Roman Catholic and Orthodox churches have done their best to deny the existence of Jesus' blood family. And they're still doing so today. But if you study the Bible closely, and the other historical texts, the real story emerges. Jesus had a large extended family and they lived here in Galilee. There is even physical evidence of their presence. Israeli archaeologist Dr. Moti Aviam has been investigating the biblical sites of Galilee for the last 25 years. The top of the hill is Nazareth, Jesus' home place. So where are we going to now? We're getting now into a cave. Eight miles away from the traditional pilgrimage site for the wedding feast of Cana, there is another site that Motti is convinced is the real location of the Jesus family wedding 2,000 years ago. Today, it's abandoned and closed to the public. <laughs> it's never before been filmed. Wow, this is an amazing cave. Uh, but what do we have here? What can we see? This stone over here, which originally was a lid of a sarcophagus, but on its side, a cross was cut. There's a period in Jesus' life that has mystified biblical scholars for centuries. Between his birth and age 30, we know virtually nothing about what he did or where he was. And now we're going to see a uh, stone jar. I believe there is a simple explanation for this. During those years, Jesus was growing up with his family here in Galilee. This is the stone jar of Jesus, the place of the miracle of transferring water into wine. And the family didn't fit the later story of his life. So when Jesus became God, they were written out of his story. And you can see this in the Bible itself. In the earliest Gospel, Mark, the brothers and sisters are clearly referred to. Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, and brother of James, and Joseph, and Judas, and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? But by the time the last gospel was written, the same passage has been changed. Is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? Jesus' brothers and sisters have been deleted. The rewriting of Jesus' family life didn't stop here. In the next part, I reveal that Jesus was not unique in his mission, that another family member was his original teacher. And in order to try to cover this up, I believe the Bible writers actually changed the story. One of the most controversial incidents in Jesus' life is when he was baptised, and in particular, the role played by John the Baptist. 
I believe that John is absolutely crucial to the story of Jesus and how he begins his messianic mission to change the world. And there is strong evidence to suggest that John and Jesus not only worked together, they were also related. People often don't think about this, but Jesus and John the Baptist are very close. They're part of the same family. It has to do with Mary, the mother of Jesus, and Elizabeth, the mother of John the Baptist. In the Gospels, you've got a word in Greek, sungenes, which means a kin person. It could be cousin, it could be aunt, but it's clearly part of the same extended family. But as with the rest of Jesus' blood family, the Bible writers have done their best to downgrade John's real status. If anyone shoots, uh, you just hide behind the vehicles or any other thing you can find. Thank you. Okay, I'll do that. Today, the site of Jesus' baptism is a closed-off military zone on the River Jordan, and you need special permission to visit it. The idea of Jesus having a real blood family was too dangerous for the early church fathers, as it challenged his divine status. So they simply removed them from the story. I think what happens with the family in general is once you exalt Jesus and Mary to such a heavenly position so that they're barely human, if human at all, then there's this tendency not only to lose sight of the others, but to even deny their importance. Oh, wow. But I believe that as well as Joseph and Mary, Jesus had four brothers, two sisters, aunts, uncles, nephews, nieces, and at least one cousin. John's mentioned, but only to point to the main guy. You picture John as pointing to Jesus, when in fact he was the inaugurator. He, he was the one who instituted the movement that Jesus joined. Amazingly, in the Bible, there is a crucial passage in the Gospel of Luke in which Jesus talks to a crowd of people and acknowledges John's key role. What then did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet. Now, there's no one except Moses that's ever called more than a prophet in the Bible. Being a prophet is very great. So in effect, Jesus is saying, yeah, he's a prophet, but he's more than a prophet. He said he's the messenger that was promised that is coming uh, to prepare the way of the Lord. Later, in the very same passage, Jesus emphasizes John's importance even further. I tell you, among those born of women, none is greater than John. But this idea, that John could be greater than Jesus was just too dangerous for the editors of the Bible. So an extra phrase was later added to put John down. A phrase that didn't exist in the earliest source of this saying. I tell you, among those born of women, none is greater than John. Yet the one who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. A pious editor quickly adds as a kind of a gloss, but the least in the kingdom is greater than John. And I really doubt if Jesus said that. Jesus being baptized by John is actually putting himself in a kind of disciple relationship with John. And I know that's shocking to people because they immediately think, oh, no, no, it's the other way around. But when Jesus is asked about John, he says that. He says that very thing. The true nature of this relationship between John and Jesus has been an acute embarrassment to the church for the last 2,000 years. Father Aliata is an expert on John's traditional story. It is, it is not uh, clear, I think, that Jesus was a disciple of John the Baptist. It, it doesn't appear nowhere. But in the book of John, the first chapter, there's a big debate about who is the Messiah? Is it John or is it Jesus? Who's sent from God? Why were people discussing that after the death of Jesus? Why was it such a big issue? Yes, because uh, certainly John the Baptist was a very, very important prophet. Um, Jesus himself 
says uh, it is uh, the more important person of the old uh, alliance, but uh, the uh, smallest in the new uh, covenant is uh, greater than John the Baptist. So it is a very important person, but more important is the new thing that Jesus is uh, giving to the, to the world now. For most Christians today, the idea that John the Baptist was Jesus' rabbi, his teacher, is still inconceivable. But right at the heart of Christianity is something that disproves this, the origins of our most famous prayer. Okay. Now there's one thing they share that is very, very interesting, and this is the prayer Jesus taught his disciples, the Our Father. Let your kingdom come, let your will be done on earth. Give us this day our daily bread. This is the signature prayer that Jesus taught his disciples. The Gospel of Luke introduces the Lord's Prayer with Jesus' disciples asking him to teach them to pray as John had done. Now it's usually understood to mean John taught his disciples to pray, so teach us to pray, maybe like a different prayer. But if you look at the Greek, it can very well imply teach us that prayer that John taught his disciples. And I think if you look at the elements of the prayer, you can make a very good case that Jesus and John both share this prayer as kind of, I would call it the core of their message. So maybe John first came up with that prayer. Just a few miles from John's traditional home, there is new physical evidence of the importance of his role in Jesus' life story. In 1999, while conducting a routine archaeological survey, Dr. Shimon Gibson found the opening to an ancient cave. So, this is the cave of John the Baptist. Wow, please come in. The cave contains archaeological evidence that it was used for ritual baptism during the time of Jesus and John. What leads you to believe that this is the cave of John the Baptist? Well, you can see very faint scratchings in the walls. In fact, these are deeply incised uh, drawings. Um, you can see the figure of John the Baptist, and he's got upraised arms, and he's got the hairy garment which is referred to in the Gospels. That's quite uh, clearly depicted. Then on the other side, you have the head of uh, John the Baptist over here. This actually would then uh, relate to the decapitation, the death of uh, John the Baptist. So in a way, with this uh, symbol, you have the end of the story of, of John the Baptist in the Gospels. Can you describe what would have taken place here in the time of John the Baptist? Well, uh, based on archaeological evidences, I would say that people came through this very large doorway, they walked down a couple of steps, and then they had this kind of earthen embankment. In a way, it was like a, a bank of a river. And then they would descend into the water itself, and there they could be baptized. They could simply immerse themselves in water. And I'd like to show you something really interesting. If you come up over here, you'll see that in the, on the top of this stone, this is a, a replica jug which we placed here. But on top of the stone is this groove here. And this groove is the, in the shape of a right foot, and it's for the placing of the right foot inside. And then a person would take the jug and then pour over the foot, the, the, the oil, and anoint the foot. Do you feel that there's been an attempt to downplay the role of John and John's work as a baptizer in the New Testament? Clearly, the, those uh, who are dealing with the writing of uh, uh, the, the Gospels are interested in the Jesus story. That's their goal. And they're only interested in, in John the Baptist insofar as it helps along the story. And of course, uh, there are certain sort of elements there that they want to downplay in order to uh, show that uh, Jesus is the, the prominent figure and that John the Baptist is the precursor, the one who is uh, uh, waiting there in the wings, preparing everything for the time that uh, uh, Jesus will, will arrive. But that there is an interesting relationship between uh, John and, and uh, Jesus. And really, the career of Jesus only um, blooms, if I may put it that way, 
after the death of uh, John the Baptist, that um, John the Baptist is clearly in command up to that point. But the Bible editors felt otherwise, and wherever possible, they tried to write John out of the story. This process is most blatant in the biblical accounts of Jesus' baptism. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. We take the earliest gospel, Mark, and we simply have the recorded fact that Jesus went down to the Jordan and was baptized by John, and he too got the calling, and uh, that's simply all that is said. In the next gospel, the story is already beginning to change. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to John to be baptized by him. John would have prevented him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? Although it mentions John baptizing Jesus here in the Jordan River, John is said to protest that he is not worthy of such a task. And then you get Luke, which is the third in line, and what does he do? He doesn't even mention that John baptized Jesus. It's very subtle. Now, when all the people were baptized, and when Jesus also had been baptized and was praying, the heavens open. And you think, well, huh, wonder who baptized him. And then you get to the fourth stage, which is the latest, Gospel of John, and there's no baptism mentioned at all. Where John baptized Jesus? Yes, here. This side. The standard way of looking at it is Jesus is the main character and he goes out to meet John and John simply introduces him almost like on the side of a stage. He says, here's Jesus, and then he walks off. But if you understand it in its context, it's actually flipped around. It's the opposite. John is the prophet. In fact, Jesus said, you think he's a prophet? He's more than a prophet. So who was greater, Jesus or John? They were the same. You think they were the same? They were both, both prophets. Jesus couldn't be greater than John. Well, uh, I, for me, it's the same. <laughs> but he's the same. Ever since Jesus was declared God, the church has struggled with the balance between his divine and human natures. And it is the divine that has won out. The losers were John the Baptist and the rest of his blood family. Tony Blair. Tony Blair. The son here. He, his son was baptized here? Yes, here. And this... Oh, that's good. That's good. He needs all the help he can get. Yeah. <laughs> you take care. In the next part, I reveal that in one of the greatest scandals in Christian history, the role of another of Jesus' blood family, the first Christian bishop, his eldest brother James, has been written out of the Christian story. In traditional Christmas scenes all over the world, the Holy Family is always depicted as just three people, Jesus, Mary and Joseph. But deep in the Judean desert, there is an ancient monastery that has a very unusual icon that includes a mysterious fourth member of the Holy Family. Hello. Hello, are you the priest? I'm looking for some pictures that you have of the Holy Family's flight into Egypt. For the last 2,000 years, the Roman Catholic and Orthodox churches have done their best to hide a scandal at the heart of the Christian story. It concerns Jesus' blood family, and in particular, the role of his eldest brother, James. Oh, right, 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 yeah. Who is there? Who, who are the people there? Maria. Mary, yeah. Mary. Jesus, Christos. Jesus, yeah. Jesus. Joseph, Jacobus. Or James. James. So, who is James? Adelphos to Christu. Adelphos to Christu. He's like the brother, like the brother of Jesus. Like his brother, but he's not his brother. Seems to me that this is very, it's very confusing. Yeah, but it's only to your Ah, sorry. Oh. 
Joseph, mm -hmm. father uh, Jacob. Yeah, Jacob. Yeah. Okay, so Joseph is the father of James, yeah. but Mary is not the mother of James. Mary is the mother of Jesus. Jesus. Right, okay, okay. You're saying that James is the son of Joseph, um, but Mary is not his mother. But it's still fascinating because it's a picture of the Holy Family and there are four of them. Despite the church's best efforts to deny his blood relationship to Jesus, I believe James is one of the most important figures in early Christianity, at least as significant as its traditional founders, Peter and Paul. Paul refers to James as the first of the three figures he calls the pillars of the Jerusalem church, James, Peter and John. He puts James first, even before Peter, in that context. Um, I think if you look hard at the New Testament, you can see that James really was as important a figure as Peter and Paul. Hidden away in Jerusalem is an Armenian cathedral dedicated to the memory of Jesus' brother James. It is supposed to be built on the site of his tomb. When Jesus died, his new movement needed a successor to take over. The non-biblical historical sources are almost unanimous as to the identity of this new leader. The disciples said to Jesus, We know that you are going to leave us. Who will be our leader? Jesus replied to them, No matter where you are, you are to go to James the Just, for whose sake heaven and earth came into being. They chose James the Just as overseer of Jerusalem. James the Just is recorded to have been the first elected to the throne of the oversight of the church in the Jerusalem. The succession of the church passed to James, the brother of the Lord. But when it comes to the Bible, you have to look very hard to uncover the truth about James's role as the first leader of Jesus' new movement. The writing of James out of Christian history uh, takes centuries, but it starts early. Where we first see it very clearly is uh, in the Gospel of Luke in the book of Acts. Mark had mentioned the brothers of Jesus and even named them. Luke comes along, he's got Mark as a source, and he comes to the passage where Mark mentions the brothers and he just deep sixes it. It's gone. It's not there. Now he gets to the story of the early movement after the death of Jesus, book of Acts. It's got 28 chapters. By chapter 9, it's all Paul. Now, in those first chapters, James is mentioned a couple of times. And it's even acknowledged that he's the leader. But it's almost a grudging admission. Oh yes, there was this guy, James. He was in charge. But Paul came along, and that's who we're really interested in. That's the beginning of the story of the writing out of James, I think, from history. It's the New Testament itself. Writes him out. But there were certain events in James's life even the Bible writers could not ignore. Twenty years after Jesus' death, the new movement faced a major crisis over its future. The question was, how strictly Jewish should it remain? All the church leaders were called to Jerusalem to decide the question. One man took the final decision. This whole thing came to a head in the Council of Jerusalem. The issue is settled by James. James has the last word. And it's James who provides a scriptural argument from the Old Testament that the Messianic people of God will include Gentiles as Gentiles, not having to become Jews. James is responsible for that. Without James, that may have continued to be a huge rift, a huge debate in the Christian church. James settles it, it's scarcely ever debated again. The followers of Jesus' new movement had a stark choice between two versions of Christianity, one based on the visions of Paul, a man who had never met Jesus, and the other, the original Jewish form, championed by James and the family of Jesus. The problem was that as more and more non-Jewish people converted to Christianity, the more marginalized James's Jewish Christians became. 
Evidence of Christianity's Jewish origins can be found on the slopes of the Mount of Olives, where there is an ancient cemetery containing the remains of thousands of religious Jews. In 1953, during routine building work, a huge complex of graves was revealed, dating back to the first century. There was even speculation they could contain the bones of some members of the very early church. This was an incredible discovery, an ancient tomb on the Mount of Olives containing hundreds of ossuaries, bone boxes. They also found inscriptions of ancient biblical names, names like Simon, Martha, Mary, Joseph, and even Jesus. Some of these could have been members of the first Jewish Christian community here in Jerusalem, led by James. But the important thing to remember is that they're buried here as Jews, not as Christians. Some of the bone boxes have crosses engraved on them. One theory is that later Christians carved them in an attempt to Christianize their Jewish occupants. Judaism became very unpopular after the Great Roman War. There was a tax put on Jews, and for someone to say, I'm Jewish, did not necessarily draw a favorable response. Oh, you're one of those hidden enemies of the emperor and of the empire. And the church disassociated itself from the Jews. If you'd ask James, what are you? He would say, I'm a Jew. I follow the God of Abraham, and I follow the leadership of my teacher, my brother, Jesus. If you go forward a couple hundred years and say, what are you? I'm a Christian who believes in the heavenly Jesus Christ, Virgin Mary, mother of God, and there's no family. The family's lost, forgotten, blotted out, totally irrelevant to this, I would call it new religion. One event proved catastrophic for James and the Jewish Christians' control of the early church. In AD 70, after a bloody revolt, the Romans captured Jerusalem and destroyed the focus of their faith, the great Jewish temple. For the last 30 years, Israeli archaeologist Professor Ronnie Reich has been investigating this calamitous event. The destruction of the temple for Jews would be like the equivalent of Mecca being destroyed for Muslims and the, the central focal point just being wiped out. Yes, yes, exactly. This would be a total catastrophe. End of the world, as we would say, for that people. For those who were slain, we have the description of uh, Flavius Josephus in his book uh, on the history of the Jewish war against uh, Rome. He tells us that the Romans entered to the, to the residential part of Jerusalem and he says rivers of blood were uh, extinguishing the, the fire, the flames. So much blood was there. We found in one house, we call it the burnt house, uh, the bones of an arm of a young girl, about 25 years old, only the arm up to the elbow, cut at the elbow. Mm -hmm. And this, of course, uh, uh, depicts the drama very vividly. Somebody cut it off and the rest of her body was not found in, in the vicinity. So in the same way that when the temple is destroyed, Judaism is destroyed and has to reconstitute itself, we could say that these Jewish Christians who are around, there's also a shift in power. They then have to rethink the focus of their faith and what they do next because there is no temple. Well, uh, those who were facing the Romans as soldiers, etc., were slain. Others fled to the desert and the rest were taken as captives to Rome. The destruction of the temple and Jerusalem dealt a body blow to the Jesus family's control over the new Christian movement. In one fell stroke, they lost their headquarters and the focal point of their faith. The initiative was now handed to the followers of their arch-rival Paul. And the center of operations moved from the small country of Palestine to the center of the known world the capital of the Roman Empire. The sacred treasures from the temple in Jerusalem were paraded in triumph through the streets of Rome, an event immortalized in the famous Titus Arch. And the looted gold was used to pay for Rome's most famous landmark, the Colosseum.
The downfall of James's Jewish Christianity was now complete, and Paul and his followers took over the new movement. The best evidence for this is found beneath the streets of Rome, where there's a huge complex of ancient burial sites, the Christian catacombs. Raffaella Giuliani, the chief inspector for the Vatican's Commission for Sacred Archaeology, agreed to show me an incredible new discovery. During the summer of 2003, a large gaping hole opened up on a private property. While we were clearing away the debris from this caved-in area, we gradually began discovering hundreds and hundreds of skeletons placed neatly on top of one another. The anthropologists have made an initial estimate that there are approximately 1,200 people there. The care with which they were buried and their proximity to the rest of the catacomb would lead me to think that they could be among the first evidence of Christianity in this area. What can we see here? These skeletons could be the remains of some of the earliest converts to Christianity ever found in Rome. What did the catacombs tell us about the success of the Christians in Rome? Well, the catacombs are a unique testimony from that point of view. The extreme size and colossal growth of these subterranean necropoli are proof of the strength and spread of Christianity, of the fact that there was an ever-increasing number of neophytes, new believers, who were joining the community. The catacombs are also renowned for their ancient Christian art and their portrayal of famous Christian leaders such as Peter and Paul. I wondered if there were any images of Jesus' family and his brother James. Unfortunately not. No, we don't have any images of that kind in the catacombs. When the focus of the Christian movement was moved to Rome by Peter and Paul, the sheer number of their new converts was the death knell for the Jesus family's control of the new Christian movement. Paul's vision of Christianity went beyond the boundaries set by Jesus' family. While they remained narrowly Jewish in their outlook, Paul wanted to reinterpret this new movement to appeal to a global audience. Although Paul had never met Jesus and only joined the movement after his death, he claimed to have spoken directly to him through a series of visionary experiences. For Paul, faith in Jesus and belief in his atoning sacrifice meant the forgiveness of sins and the promise of eternal life. It was an incredibly powerful message. And it's Paul's version of Christianity that is still with us today. Everywhere you go in Rome, you are reminded of who won the struggle for control of Christianity. The losers, James and Jesus' family, are nowhere to be seen. So when the history of the new movement was first written, it was the winners who did it. A hundred years ago, the Vatican set up a special institute to guard the Bible against false interpretation. One of its professors, Father Dean Burchard, agreed to meet me. Why is James so marginalized in church history? I mean, we see no pictures or statues of him in Rome. Yeah, that's true. And unfortunately, most of the history of that Jerusalem church is lost. If it were not for Luke, with a few recording, the few little things that he learned, we'd know next to nothing at all. You know, and so most of that history is lost, and it's tragic. So you don't believe Luke was trying to write James out of the story and promote Paul over James? Well, you're very, you know, it's true, and that's, that's an issue in the study of the Acts of the Apostles, you know, that it's a selective history, you know, it's, it's just a few pieces of that puzzle Luke chose to include. And as a historian, I try to be as objective as possible and try to do a critical understanding and reading, interpretation of the evidence that's there. But I don't begin with a basic suspicion against the tradition. I begin 
as a Jesuit with the basic assumption that the, tra the, tra the tradition of the church is trustworthy. Surely the family of Jesus is just an embarrassment to the church. They just don't fit the story. Christians, I think, in every generation have had interest and curiosity about that. But that curiosity has generated fanciful, speculative, imaginary images and stories about the family of Jesus. And I would suggest that this whole reconstruction of James and the early church is another example of that. I am convinced that James ran the New Jesus movement for 30 years until his death and that the Jesus family's control of the church in Jerusalem lasted for another 50 years until they finally disappeared from the historical record. Peter and Paul had won. I think the tragedy really of Jewish Christianity was that it got disowned by both sides. It got disowned by the mainstream Christian movement which was increasingly Gentile. It got disowned by rabbinic Judaism Eventually, in the 4th century, Jerome says the trouble with the Jewish Christians is they want to be both Jews and Christians, as a result of which they are neither. For the Jewish Christians themselves, it was obvious that they could be both, but nobody else allowed them to be both, and they got left out. In the Church of St. Paul's, outside the walls of Rome, built on the site of Paul's tomb, there are portraits of every pope from the very beginning of the church right through to the present day with one key absentee, James. Even though he was the first Christian bishop. The church also has one of the biggest murals in Rome. It depicts Jesus flanked by Peter and Paul but also includes Luke the man who wrote a large part of the New Testament and the person who did the most to write the Jesus family out of the story. The importance of the family of Jesus, I think, really was that they were the key leaders uh, within Jewish Christianity. You know, and it's no exaggeration to say that James was as important as Peter and Paul. And if more of the legacy of James had survived, then perhaps the church would not have become so shockingly anti-Jewish. In the final part, I show that the ultimate reason for the writing out of Jesus' blood family is that their version of the Christian message as handed down by Jesus himself was totally at odds with the later church. There is a small village in Syria where the people still speak Aramaic, the language spoken 2,000 years ago by Jesus and his family. Every year, the villagers commemorate their ancient Christian heritage by celebrating the finding of the cross in Jerusalem on which Jesus was crucified. It's also a date that marks the church's final victory over Jesus' blood family. I believe that Jesus had a mother, father, four brothers, at least two sisters, aunts, uncles, nephews and nieces. One of his relatives, John the Baptist, was his spiritual teacher and helped start his mission. After Jesus' death, his eldest brother James took over control of the church and ran it for another 30 years. Ever since, the Roman Catholic and Orthodox churches have not only hidden the true story, they've also suppressed their version of Christianity. The original message handed down by Jesus himself because it was too dangerous. But amazingly, if you know where to look, 
you can still find it in the Bible itself. You know, even though James and the family have been written out of history and marginalized within the New Testament, it's not wholly lost. And you know, the nice thing about it, it's on the pulpit of every church in the world. It's right there in the New Testament. You open it up, you got to dig, you got to find it. But the shades and shadows of the brothers, of the family, of its importance and what it means is, is still there. We can recover it. Hidden away at the back of every Bible are two remarkable letters that some historians believe are written by the followers of Jesus' brothers, James and Jude. Today's version of Christianity, as handed down from Paul, proclaims salvation through faith in Jesus Christ as the Son of God. The brothers' version is totally different. Theirs concentrates on what Jesus taught and his blueprint for changing the world, and a lot of it is revolutionary stuff. The Syriac Orthodox, one of the oldest established churches in the world, uses a form of worship it claims was written by Jesus' brother James. But I believe it and the rest of the Christian world has lost touch with Jesus' original message. Some people believe the book of James is actually a dangerous book because he warns the rich and the powerful that they face judgment from God. Is that spirit still one that your church believes in? Well, we, we as a church, don't interfere in politics. You don't interfere in politics? As a church. As a church. But we advise and encourage our faithful as individuals to be involved in all the politic matters. They are free to do so. But as a church it is dangerous if the church will adopt any idea, political idea. Yes. The first station. Here Jesus the letters of Jesus' brothers were so dangerous that for hundreds of years the church fathers refused to include them in the Bible. They were only finally accepted because the oral traditions concerning Jesus' family were so strong. There were some Christian leaders who said, well, James, I don't know if we should include him. Now, he's the brother of Jesus. Why wouldn't you want his letter? Because if you read the letter, it doesn't have the gospel that people came to associate with Christianity. In complete contrast to today's Christianity, the letters of Jesus' brothers describe him as their master, but not divine. They see Jesus as a human character blessed by God. The thing about the book of James, it's the teachings of Jesus, but not the teachings about Jesus. James passes on what he got from his brother. You could say it has no theology. The seventh stage. And yet it does have a theology, but it's the theology of Jesus. But it's no theology about Jesus in that book. Doesn't mention the cross of Christ. Doesn't mention the blood of Jesus. Doesn't mention forgiving sins through believing in the Lord, our Savior, who's in heaven. Nothing like that. It's an amazing book to read. This alternative version of Jesus' message can be found in other texts too. In the Greek quarter of the old city of Jerusalem, there is another ancient book that was not included in the Bible. It's one of the most contested of early Christian documents, possibly even older than the Gospels themselves. I believe it is the key to understanding Jesus' original message. I'm very sorry that the library is not in its proper situation. But because the Library of the Greek Patriarch has the only complete copy of an ancient handbook specially written for converts to Christianity that was compiled when Jesus' family was still alive. The Didache gives a direct insight into what the very earliest Christians thought and did. It has never before been filmed. Can I hold it? Yes. Wow. This is like being close to the early church. Of course. Wow. And, and um, you, I'm not using gloves, is that okay? It's okay. It's I'm okay. not using as well. Yes. Wow. The book begins here, 
Οδό δύο ίση, μία τη ζωή και μία του θανάτου. There are two ways, one of the life and one of the death. The Didache, or teaching, contains a code of Christian ethics based on the original teachings of Jesus and some instructions as to the proper forms of worship. There is a great difference between the two ways. But what makes it so dangerous for today's Christianity is what it leaves out. There is no mention of the virgin birth, no mention of the resurrection, and above all, no mention of Jesus as God. They talk of Jesus in here as Lord and not Lord God, suggesting that they saw him as being more human than divine. How does that strike you? In my opinion, in the evangelists, in the Gospels, and in the works of apostles, uh, there is a balance uh, between uh, presentation of uh, Christ as the Son of God and as the Son of a man. The Lord to whom we believe is uh, divine, but he is human. And that's the problem. For 2,000 years, the church has grappled with the balance between Jesus' divine and human natures. But it is the divine that has dominated. In the process, it is Jesus' essential humanity and the humanity of his teachings that has been lost. Yes. The Didache also contains a detailed description of a very early communion service. Unlike today, there is no suggestion that the bread and wine are the body and blood of Christ. In fact, Jesus is referred to not as God's son, but his servant. And concerning the broken bread, we thank you, our Father, for the life and knowledge which you made known to us through Jesus, your servant. To you belongs the glory forever. Do you think that one of the reasons why they don't mention Jesus as Lord God and they don't mention the resurrection was because they didn't believe that those events had taken place, that Jesus wasn't the Son of God and that Jesus wasn't raised from the dead, but instead he was a human, a prophet, and not divine. It's a dangerous question. In my opinion, uh, the fact of the resurrection of Christ uh, couldn't and shouldn't be ignored. Uh, Paul speaks and says, if Christ uh, was not resurrected, then we shall be accused that we, uh, we speak falsely against God. What is absolutely fundamental to all Christians, including myself, is the idea that Jesus is God. Without that, there is no Christianity. But what is now clear is that the very earliest Jewish Christians, including Jesus' own family, did not see him as God. And ultimately, that is why the church has gone so far to delete them from the Christian story. This is Judas, uh, the brother of the Lord according to the flesh. Jude. Jude, yeah, yeah, Jude. who has written an epistle. In the Bible, and in the letter of Jesus' younger brother Jude, there is an extraordinary passage denouncing a group of people who are secretly corrupting the true faith. For admission has been secretly gained by some who long ago were designated for this condemnation, ungodly persons who pervert the grace of our God. If you decode it, it becomes a clear warning that the new movement was losing sight of Jesus' original message. By the time Jude writes, he could see the writing on the wall. He could see we're losing out. And it's a battle cry. It's a call to arms, spiritually speaking. He's not talking about outsiders. He's talking about people who claim to be part of us that are not teaching what we were originally handed down. These are grumblers, malcontents, following their own sinful desires. They are loudmouth boasters, flattering people to gain advantage. And he's getting very worried, and he's telling the little group that would still listen to him. I think, in effect, he's saying, don't listen to all these new things that are coming along. You fight hard for that original faith that was delivered to us, family tradition. 
follow the tradition of the family. Almost a mute testimony to what used to be the way. When Constantine the Great made Christianity the official religion of the Roman Empire 1600 years ago, it was Paul's interpretation of Jesus' message that was adopted. And Paul based his authority on a series of mystical visions, although he had never met Jesus and only joined the movement after his death. By contrast, James and the rest of the family who had grown up with Jesus followed his mission and being at his death, their version of Christianity, a vision of Jesus as a more human character, was declared heresy. So what do I as a Christian think about this? I still choose to believe that Jesus is God because it's hard to deny 1600 years of church tradition and like Paul and millions of other Christians, I too have had a personal experience of Jesus. That's why I became a Christian. But my personal faith also tells me that we're all guilty of losing sight of Jesus' original human message. A message that confronted oppression and injustice in the world. A message that created a powerful moral and ethical code. And a message that heralded the kingdom of God on earth here and now. And for me, this is the real conspiracy that Dan Brown and the others have missed. The greatest conspiracy in Christian history the denial of Jesus' original message.